Welcome back to Hashtag Fish. In the second episode of the Shrimp Culture Playlist, we will be going through one of the most fascinating aspects of animal biology, which happens when an animal goes from something like this to this, and then to this, only then to become this, which is not even a proper shrimp yet. Today we'll go through the different life stages of a painted shrimp, which has a quite unique larval phase then to become a post larvae. It is important that we understand these stages as the shrimp is very sensitive, fragile and demanding for our attention so we can get the grasp of what it is to culture shrimp. And this is because each stage has a unique demand for a certain type of feeds and environment. Before we dive deep into what they look and what they eat, let us first have a look into the double life of a shrimp. Why do I say double life? Well, shrimp has an oceanic life when they are born, or better say when they hatch, but their juvenile years are not spent at sea. The late post larvae and juveniles, they enter coastal lagoons and estuaries and their mangroves, which are shallower than the sea and are naturally rich in nutrients in organic matter and support an immense natural productivity to give support to uh, complex food webs which the shrimp is part of. So we could say that parent shrimp send their kids to a boarding school far away from where they live. Or maybe not. Let us have a better look at this. Here we have two main areas where the shrimp naturally live, the ocean and the estuaries. It all starts with the animals first maturing their gonads, that is the testes in the males and the ovaries in the females. Here's a picture. We have a mature female with ovaries full. Now you may have bought a shrimp before and seen a yellow to green stripe over its back and perhaps thought it was the intestine full of poo. But actually in this case, uh, it should be a female ripe and full of eggs. The intestine runs below the ovaries and the appearance when full is a dark brown or light brown in the case of a farm shrimp that has eaten pelleted feeds and not yellow or green. So when the adults are ready in, in the breeding season, they will mate. The male, which in the case of a shrimp is the smaller partner, will chase the female and try to get under her to transfer the spermatophore from its petasma into the female's telecom. In the case of Lithopeneus vanamei, the male will turn its head around the female for this transfer, where for Pineus monodon, the male will embrace the female in a perpendicular position. Remembering the first episode, that for the giant tiger prawn, the telecom is closed, so this transfer can only happen when the female has molted and is with a soft shell. Then let's say that the eggs have been successfully fertilized, as you can see here on this picture on the left and the embryo will start to develop, which is the case of the photograph in the middle, and about half a day after fertilization, eggs will hatch into the first larval stage, which is called nauplius, a singular, and nauplii for plural. We will talk about the shrimp hatchery and larval quality in the upcoming episode. For now, let's just appreciate the different larval stages and substages for you to have a better idea of the complexity of a shrimp life cycle. Each stage has several substages. For instance, Nauplius can have five or six substages called Nauplius 1, Nauplius 2, 3, and so on. At each stage, the complexity of the appendages increase, and so the whole biology. Remember for this tiny shrimp, it's still less than one millimeter in size and relies only on the nutritional provisioning given by the mother into its yolk. So at this stage, it does not feed, but cannibalize on its own reserves. Molting stage, as we'll discuss, is a very energy consuming process. And for all of this to be successful, we have to start to appreciate the importance of a good environment and nutrition for the broodstock to be able to supply the nutrients, the energy for the Nauplius to go through all of these five or six molds on their own. It's actually quite important for the hatchery staff to be able to easily identify 
in the microscope what stage and substage the animals are so that they can uh, correctly time the live feeds uh, required for the upcoming stage. For now, plus, shrimp will then mold into a protozoa, which also called a zoa for simplicity. So zoa will start to have the appearance of a shrimp, but as you can see here, their morphology and physiology is, not, is still quite limited. At the zoa stage, a rudimentary intestine is formed, so the shrimp will start feeding on microalgae suspended in water, uh, in particular planktonic diatoms. As it can be seen in these images, zoa does not have periopods, the walking legs if you remember from first episode, which means that they only swim short distances through the water column and of course they will not walk on the substrate. As all the larval stages, they cannot swim the currents and therefore they are also considered planktonic. Also for this reason, the larval tanks are normally a U-shape with aeration running along the deepest part of the tank to keep everything uh, that is the larvae, microalgae in suspension and well homogenized in the water column. They will stay in each stage for approximately 30 hours before molting again and moving on with their life cycle. At the end of Zoet 3, the next molt will then be into the first Mises stage. Here again, another shift in complexity is the fact that Mises now is not just vegetarian, but it becomes omnivore, eating small organisms like uh, now plus of other tiny crustaceans. In the hatchery for simplicity and ease, the newly hatched Artemia, also called the Artemia nauplii, is used. Firstly frozen to facilitate the capture and then live, which stimulates the appetite. With a much more nutrient-dense diet, Mises will go through each molt a bit faster now, taking about uh, one day in each substage. Then finally, after the third Mises stage, the shrimp will become a post larvae. The post larval stage is still very delicate and still have many organs to develop completely, like the gills. So you may wonder, how does the shrimp larvae breathe if not through the gills? It basically breathes through the cuticle or the skin as gas diffusion is facilitated because the carapace is so thin and there are so many appendages that they have a lot of surface area for gas exchange. So as a recap of what we covered today here, we spoke about the general life cycle of a painted shrimp and the two environments where they live. When we farm shrimp, the ponds simulate the estuary, the part of the environment where juveniles naturally grow. Here is a perfect example in the south of Brazil. You see this farm was set up uh, along to the lagoon where shrimp naturally grows. This farm was donated by the group Iacot to the Federal University of Santa Catarina after failing to farm kruma prawn here in the 90s. Well, I should say that they did succeed farming shkuruma here, but they were never able to produce enough to recover their investment. The university then remodeled the farm as has been successful, graduating many students in shrimp farming and successfully producing venom for many years until white spot came and made it impossible for production under the traditional semi-intensive and open farming system. We also covered here the very different, interesting and complex larval stages and substages of a painted shrimp. So you know now what a nauplius, a zoe, a mesis uh, and a pl look like. If you found the content that these types of videos bring to you, please share them with your community. Also help to encourage the YouTube algorithms to understand that there is value in this project. Please give it a thumbs up so that more people will be introduced to the video when they search for aquaculture. Thank you and we'll see you in episode 3 where we will cover shrimp molting and growth in more detail.